All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for coming out to this meeting tonight. My name is Nolan Rampy. I am um, a member of Tempest Collective. Um, this meeting uh, is, I think, a really important topic tonight. Um, it is, will the lesser evil stop the greater evil, the 2024 elections and social movements? I think probably as many folks know here, um, the left involved in social justice runs into the same problem every single election cycle of being told that we have to sort of tamp down our demands, subvert our demands in the interests of getting the Democrats elected um, in order to stop the Republicans from coming to power, only to see our movements betrayed over and over again. And so this leads to this very important question of like, what do leftists and people involved in left-wing movements do around the elections. And again, as this is a reoccurring question, I think it is uh, a more important question now than ever before. And so we've got a great slate of panelists that are going to talk about this question of how movements should relate to the Democrats from a variety of different perspectives and different movements. And I'll let them um, you know, talk about specifically the angle that they're going to be approaching um, as they speak. But I am really excited about this panelist of speakers. Um, I will introduce them one at a time as they as it is their turn to speak. Um, but to go ahead and get things underway, our first speaker this evening is going to be Paul Fleckenstein. He is a member of the Tempest Collective as well um, and is a longtime organizer in Burlington and part of the uh, Palestine coalition um, that is currently organizing right now. So I will throw it over to you, Paul. I'm sorry. Um, sure. The Tempest Collective is a national uh, socialist organization with um, groupings all around the United States and seeks to, you know, build a Marxist revolutionary movement in, in the United States and keep that tradition alive. And I'll have more to say about it at the very end. Can I use the mic? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Right ahead here. That's probably pretty good. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. The topic is broad, and i um, not sure what the other panelists are going to say, let alone what's going to come up in the discussion. So I'm going to do some bullet points to frame um, some of the discussion, hopefully. So uh, despite the, the pageantry of the DNC um, convention, we still face multiple social crises not caused by Trump ramped up migration violence, imperial wars, and genocide, the growth of gender violence, massive wealth inequality and precarity, ecological breakdown. The US elections once again present dismal options of two capitalist parties, one lesser evil, one greater evil. The greater evil um, is the far right Republican party of untethered bigotry, racism, campaigning on mass deportations, destruction of public health, education institutions, gutting of environmental protection, and abandonment of civil rights, among other things. The lesser evil party, the Democratic Party, with better rhetoric, a uh, historic black woman at the head of the ticket, although we should get beyond identity politics around this to the policies, Recognition of my, and recognition of minority rights, but it's also committed to genocide and empire, a draconian border regime, racist policing, expanding fossil fuel extraction, and Wall Street profits. So a couple of things are important to say, I think, in, in the context of this. The, the crises can't, these crises can't be overcome in the, in the near term. They've been shaped over decades and can't be addressed in an election cycle especially when the left has weak infrastructures of struggle and organization. Since the Great Recession of 2008, there has increased polarization of mass consciousness to the left and to the right. But in the political establishment, we're not seeing that reflected. We're seeing an asymmetrical polarization where the far right is reflecting the right change, but um, the political 
um, the Democrats are holding tight to the political center. So there's no expression of the radicalization that we are seeing, for instance, for instance in the Palestine movement in the election. There is urgency and things to do in organizing, but we need to be clear in the starting point. For this discussion, I think we can all assume that we're opposed, that we, we share a commitment to confronting the far right and opposing genocide. The question isn't how anyone individually votes, but rather a strategic perspective and what our movements and organizations do with our time, with our money. And I just note that Harris has accumulated um, half a billion dollars since announcing the run for the presidency. And, um, and with our political energy. Uh, the particular form of the less evil strategy on the left can be called inside outside, or you might know it by um, block and build, block the right and build the left without and within the Democratic Party. So again, the question is, how are we actually going to win the alternative that we need? Um, the historical record is important. One place to start, for instance, is what's happened under Biden. Um, the Biden government has made big gains. Um, under the Biden government, the far right has made big gains in the areas of abortion restrictions, gender oppression, migration, the growth of ethno-nationalist politics, false democratic promises of economic, climate, and social improvement fuel the right, unfortunately, much more than the left. So there's a historical record that we need to, to go over. Elections matter. They shape mass consciousness and political hopes and horizons and confidence and influence movements and mass struggle, the key factors in changing things. Under the lesser evil duopoly, this is mostly in a bad direction. This is why socialists from Frederick Engels onward in the 19th century have argued that the exploited and the press, the working class, we need our own party um, to express our demands. The Democratic Party is not democratic at all. Its ability to co-op, contain, and suppress left challenges inside the party is greater than at any time in its history. From the donor-led palace coup against Biden to the DNC exclusion of Palestine and Chicago, it's impervious. Um, it's an institution of career operatives, partnership with capitalist investors and corporations, elected officials, and donor networks and it has an iron grip. In other words, it's the world's most successful capitalist party. What about third parties? Well, certainly with what we face with lesser evilism, I can understand the appeal. There are certain questions we can start with. Can, um, do these parties have an organic connection to movements? Do they express, cohere, and aid our class and social struggles and the left? Are they consistent advocates of national liberation struggles, not just Palestine, but also Ukraine? Are they for popular resistance against anti-democratic regimes, not just in the US, but in China, uh, uh, under Assad in Syria, in Iran, for instance? Without organic connection to mass struggle, third-party campaigns may also share the lesser evilism uh, distortion where change comes from emphasizing the ballot box over mass movements and struggle. And finally on this, any convincing third-party labor um, uh, the Socialist Party is going to have to be rooted in broad working class movements and unions and, and social movements organizations to be convincing to people. So I want to wrap up on a few thoughts on the dynamics of um, the elections and social struggle. So the strategy of less real evilism where we join our enemies um, to counter the far right um, undermines uh, our capacities by one, um, undermining movements and infrastructures of struggle to privilege elections, two, suppressing left socialist and anti-capitalist political frameworks, and three, undermining political horizons. And all this seeds ground to the far right while winning, winning us little um, or um, if anything. So for example, lesser evilism tends to turn into boosterism. You know, after all, it's hard to argue, vote for my candidate because they're better than the other one, right? Um, so think of one supposedly left political challenger to the Democratic Party establishment, AOC, mm -hmm. at the convention who lauded 
Harris for defending Palestinians. So this isn't his boosters, and this is cynical and or delusional, right? Um, same thing with Sanders, uh, who per has promoted Biden as the most progressive president, you know, despite genocide, despite ramping up a regime of border violence at the southern border with Mexico and across Latin America. Um, you know, what happened to abolish ICE, which Harris gave some lip service to, you know, now it's all build Trump's wall better than Trump, right? Second, the electoral system is rigged. Um, ballot access outside of the two parties is very limited and difficult. Uh, gerrymandering uh, ensures that there, that most seats that go for election uh, in Congress are safe seats. So there can be very little change from election to election, gridlock, and then a lot of false promises uh, from candidates because it's locked um, in, in Congress. And finally, after that, there's the court system, great, which is able to um, dismiss um, trash legislative reforms um, that do happen to get passed. Um, and then finally, regardless whoever wins the election, um, there will be some sort of constitutional crisis, the federal government versus the states. You know, Whatever candidate wins, there's going to be unresolved questions about jurisdiction. And Louisiana, Alabama, Florida, you know, the horrors there are not going to be resolved by the election. And the last thing, uh, by way of example, is that lesser evilism reinforces the acceptance of catastrophe. So with Harris, for instance, accommodating to lesser evil genocide, and I've heard this, the genocide will be better under Harris than under Trump, right? Um, or Biden around climate, despite rising emissions, rising extraction, you know, what happened to the radical Green New, New, New Deal? You know, the horizon is way back to, oh, maybe we can electrify something. Um, so this is harmful to our movements, the illusion of a friend in the White House or a commitment to protecting that supposed bulwark against Trump also discourage the often promised protests and agitation after election day. We're already seeing this happen. The, pro the turnout at the DNC protests in Chicago, lower than expected, right? Despite Harris having the same policies, the same rhetoric, you know, being identical with the Biden administration in terms of Gaza. It also teaches people that they can't fight in the face of the far right, despite the history of progressive movements successfully resisting violence and oppression. Um, think of the civil rights movement, battle in the South. Think of the establishment of unions and the incredible violence that they faced on the terms of you know, right-wing goon squads. And that was done by us. It wasn't done by re relying on a capitalist party. Um, so, yeah, and you know, at any bump in the road, the alliance with the Democrats, they'll derail it when capitalist interests are threatened or when their electoral prospects are threatened. The final thing, and it's a more upbeat conclusion, <laughs> um, the, Palestine, the Palestine movement is pushing the limits of lesser evilism, right? And I think it's a precious movement for everyone's future. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Paul. Um, all right. Next up, we have Wafiq Faor, who is a longtime member of Vermonters for Justice in Palestine. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> evil is evil. <laughs> if it came from the left of this country or the right of this country. For us, when we look at election or the Democratic Party and Republican Party, we are just waiting to see who will appoint the people to do or to deliver because the policy is the same. Both candidates, they are working for a system that regardless who's in the helm, the system is still working. In the Middle East, or what's so-called the Department of Near East inside the State Department, we are waiting who will 
appoint the people working on that department? Is it Sheldon Adelson's wife or Saban wife? The Brookings Institute will come in and the question of Palestine will continue the same way, you know? Frankly, you're going to be surprised. I, I will sound like the uh, bird singing out of its flock here. I am one of the people who prefer somebody uh, talking about the Middle East like a Trump. A Trump, Mrs. Adelson promised $100 million if he can declare that the West Bank is part of Israel. Trump came in and delivered. He said Israel is a small country and we should expand that. Actually, this is the American policy. It's not a Trump, but a Trump has a price for it and he delivered. Why it is hard for us when it comes from the Democratic Party, the same kind of policy? Very small reason. We're talking about the left as if it's part of both parties, as if out, never participated. We are wrong. The Democrats' main pillars are what the left accomplished on the last 40, 50 years, building unions and working for the labor's movements. The unions are part of that tent. Same social and racial justice movement and activists, they are part of that tent. For many years, I thought if we get into that tent, we may have slice of the cake. Many Palestinians, Arabs, and Muslims, actually, they believe the same thing. Even it was very humiliating and hard to hear the uncommitted speech that promised to be delivered on the stage. They wished to have only one moment of the stage to tell Camilla that we are with you, but my name is such and such, and I am a Palestinian American from Georgia. Why it is a humiliating? Because we are living on different time. It's true that the system works very greased and old, and we one of the two going to be the president. But America, for the future, is no different than the situation of Israel in the future. Israel is weaker. I'm not saying weak that it is the end of Israel. I'm saying it is weaker. And the weaker Israel is, United States is weaker. And when Israel goes down for self-inflicted sins, United States is going down the same way. What I wish you, left, right, center, American, just to think as American for a change. What is better for you? Don't tell me which such policy on here or there is the interest of the United States. No, it is the interest of the 4% of the United States, the people who can afford to buy and sell the government and everything in America for sale. We experience it, we see it, and it's inflicting death to us and to many people around the world. American, how much they are concerned or supporting the Palestinians these days, which is, we are grateful to that. We do appreciate it, but they have a short memory. And they move on after that. We are one out of many. America thinks of itself, we have a democratic system, 
that is functioning, my opinion, they have a system, it's democratic by the name, it's selective. We, the people, not only the Palestinians, and many people are out of this. We are not counted as part of this country or have a voice on this country, and we are experiencing it every day, every single day. Not only on the federal level, on the state level as well, and it reflects itself, you know, they see it. What they wish to have, the Palestinian Solidarity Group in Chicago, we experience it here. We were part of a movement to stand up and remind every, every uh, uh, contender uh, to be president, remember the genocide in Palestine. And we did that to Kamala as well. But we went and got invited inside and we kept our promise to our base that we will never vote for her as long as her stand as she's taking now, which is no different than Biden and Trump. Kamala is not going to stop the war. Kamala is part of the war machine. And Kamala is worse for us than the rest too. It's hard, very hard to a Palestinian to criticize a black woman. It's painful to us. And it's more painful to talk to the movement for the black lives and others and keep talking and get uh, into seminars every week, you know, but it's different and we have a chance to push her on the right direction. We've been lied before. I was part of that. I knocked on the door when Barack Obama, I knocked on the door on this town. For, for conclusion, yes, don't vote for neither one of them. Choose a third party or vote for our ambitional, an American martyr for just cause. Do anything to wake up at least on the state level because we need them in our work to wake them up that if they don't recognize the Palestinian and they don't recognize the Palestinian who are living under occupation and apartheid, if they don't do something about it, we are here to go after them like we did on the city of Burlington. Less than that, you are not supporting the Palestinian cause. Kamala is not our option. Thank you. Thank you, Wafiq. Um, next up, we have Tristan Aidy from the Healthcare Workers for Palestine. Um, thanks. So first of all, I want to thank Tempest, the Tempest Collective for asking me to speak. Um, and they had asked specifically that I speak about abortion, um, which is something that as a healthcare provider and also someone who was an activist around abortion rights for many, many years, I, I feel pretty strongly about. Um, and when I started preparing for this talk, I, I made a point of, you know, looking for um, as many specifics as I could find on Kamala Harris's um uh, actual policy promises when it came to abortion, because I thought maybe I'd missed something, right? Like, she, certainly she's talked a lot about abortion. She has given a lot of fiery speeches about how she's not gonna allow women to be dragged backwards and so on. And I thought, I, I really must have missed the actual policy <laughs> position that she's put out there. So I went to her website and um, this is what her website said. Um, uh, Kamala Harris is leading the charge to protect fundamental freedoms, including the right to an abortion and the right to vote. And you can charge. So there's literally nothing about how she's going to do that. Um, 
I came across at least an article from Politico magazine at the end, um, from the end of July that reported that they reached out to her campaign specifically for, for her, you know, what she's going to do. Um, they, her campaign responded to them and said, quote, the stance the vice president took in a September interview with Face the Nation hasn't changed, meaning support for restoring Roe, which protected abortion until the point of fetal, vi fetal viability around 22 weeks of pregnancy. In that Face the Nation interview from September, this is before she was running for office, but okay, Harris uh, was challenged, you know, the interviewer was saying, you're not telling me specifically what you want to do, please be precise. And she said, I am being precise. We need to put into law the protections of Roe v. Wade, and that is about going back to where we were before the Dobbs decision. The mechanism for restoring Roe would be federal legislation enacted by Congress, but this is the most specific, we're going back to Roe. Um, now, leaving aside whether Congress would in fact pass such legislation, which is a tall order, right? The Democrats would have to win both houses of Congress in addition to the presidency. They'd have to have the political appetite to actually create federal legislation and pass it. Leaving that aside, it's really important to look at the specifics here. Um, not because we're looking for, you know, gotcha language or purism, all the sort of things that the left is often accused of. You're, you just want the perfect candidate and you won't vote for anything less than that. No, it's, it's, it's important to know what the world looked like under Roe um, before Dobbs because the devil is 100% in the details. Um, so what did abortion look like, you know, just a little bit over a year ago? Um, Certainly for about 50 years, from 1973 to 2023, we saw the steady erosion of abortion rights for a majority of the population going all the way back to 1976, right? So the Hyde Amendment with the blessing of many Democrats was passed, which banned the use of Medicaid funds to pay for abortions for people who didn't have money. It continued with the creation of mandatory waiting periods for people seeking abortions. So preposterous, right? You actually go to the trouble of making an appointment to talk about getting an abortion, and in many states, you'd have to sit through all kinds of anti-science, not medically sound propaganda about how abortion was gonna ruin your life, it was gonna ruin your body, it could give you cancer, a lot of falsehoods. And then you'd have to go home or somewhere else for 48 to 72 hours, and then come back and actually perhaps be entitled to an abortion. That was one of the restrictions. Requirements for parental consent, right? So let's say you're a 15-year-old who's actually been raped by your father. You actually, in many states, had to get um, consent from parents in order to proceed with an abortion. Or in some states, maybe it wasn't consent, but they, your parents would at least have to be notified. Total nightmare for kids living in abusive families. Um, we saw onerous anti-science, anti-medicine requirements for clinics and providers to meet that have no parallel elsewhere in the delivery of healthcare, right? So what size is the operating suite gonna be? How many uh, support staff will there be? What's the waiting time? You know, all kinds of, 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 of requirements that actually drove a number of abortion clinics out of practice altogether because they couldn't meet them. Um, bans on abortions after 15 weeks, an outrageous arbitrary cutoff that has nothing to do with fetal viability and rests on the assumption that pregnant people and their healthcare providers are not capable of deciding when an abortion is necessary. Um, we saw allowances for private insurance um, to refuse or limit coverage of abortion in a number of states. And we saw the banning of abortion coverage for patients enrolled in the Affordable Care Act exchange plans in a number of states. So before it was Roe Ro was overturned, as of last year, one in 10 abortion seekers were already traveling across state lines for care, which effectively, I mean, you're not just traveling, right? It, it turns your entire life upside down. You're scrambling for the money to pay for travel, to stay somewhere while you're out of state. You're having to make arrangements for childcare and time off of work, to say nothing of the actual cost of the abortion itself. And of course, a majority of people were scrambling to pay for abortions, even in states where it was legal and relatively unencumbered by a lot of restrictions, because 75% of abortion seekers have incomes that place them below the federal poverty level. It's been inaccessible for thousands of people for a really long time. So while I wish that Harris was actually the champion of abortion rights um, that she's making herself out to be, she actually falls right in line where most Democratic leaders have been over the last several decades, agreeing to the principle that pregnant people have the right to an abortion, but on a defensive basis, unwilling to unapologi unapologetically call for unfettered access to abortion for anyone at any time in their pregnancy, in any part of the country, regardless of their ability to pay. Instead, the Democrats have followed the line for years that Hillary Clinton championed when she was running for office for president to, quote, keep abortion safe, legal, and rare. 
Sounds like a nice idea, but what does that actually mean? It actually fell right in line with this idea that the right had pushed for years, that abortion is an agonizing, morally fraught, terrible decision that people struggle with. It's something to be ashamed of. Right? It is none of those things. Talk to anybody who's had an abortion. The vast majority of people will go, thank God that's over. Now I can actually get back to the life that I was planning now that I, an unintended pregnancy is over. The vast majority of, of people who have had abortions do not actually regret the decision and don't talk about it being some sort of moral quandary. Um, and when the right first started campaigning to restrict late-term abortions, which they shamefully, fraudulently called partial birth abortions, the Democrats fell in line and obviously are continuing to do so. Instead of getting up and tell the, telling the stories of why people have abortions in the first place, um, especially late-term abortions, which, you know, spoiler, it's usually because the fetus is not in a position, is not viable, it's not going to survive a pregnancy, the, the pregnant person's health is endangered, or they were unable to access abortion early in their, in their pregnancies. Nor did the Democrats dare ever make the argument that none of this is the business of the government or anyone else for that matter, right? It's so important to say that when a pregnant, what a pregnant person does with their own body is their business and theirs, theirs alone. There is no other arena of healthcare that is actually legislated so arbitrarily and scrutinized and restricted like this. It's so political, it is so aimed at making pregnant people feel like they don't have control over their own bodies, their own destinies, and they certainly can't be trusted to make their own decisions. Um, so these restrictions not only de facto restricted access for thousands of, of pregnant people, they really helped reinforce the stigma and shame surrounding abortion. Now, interestingly, there was a shift at the Democratic National Convention, right? They actually did have some women who had had abortions get up and speak, or women who had been affected by the Dobbs decision. Um, and the words abortion and abortion rights are actually being used by Democratic politicians right now, which blows me away. That's not something they were willing to do for so long. It was, we're pro-choice, we're pro-choice. Quiet down the language about abortion. We don't want to actually be explicit about the procedure because, again, that shame, this sort of kowtowing to the right, thinking, well, if we just present ourselves as more moderate, you know, people will, will somehow shift over. That little slice of undecided voters in the center is going to go with us instead of with the Republicans. But in all honesty, that language, the fact that they're actually allowing some of those stories to reach the main stage of the convention, allowing themselves to use the words abortion rights, it feels very manipulative. They know it's one of the only issues that they can rely on to differentiate themselves from the Republicans. And it may even move some independent and moderate voters towards them. Um, Gretchen Whitmer's example in Michigan is really interesting, right? Like everywhere she went when she was campaigning for re-election, including union halls, she had all kinds of information, or uh, all kinds of um, signs and information sheets out about how she was championing, and, uh, championing abortion rights. And, Lo and behold, she not only got, you know, she got reelected with no problem, she actually had Republican women campaigning for her in some cases. So the, I think the Democratic Party leadership is, has, paid, has taken notice of that. Um, and because the Harris campaign has been very vague about what she actually pro intends to propose or enact, it has allowed people to graft all kinds of hopes and expectations onto her, right? Like when people say, well, I hate what she's doing in Palestine, or I hate the fact that she's continuing support for genocide, but I think it's really important to protect women's right to choose, et cetera. It's because they think that federal legislation means we go back to the days of, you know, maybe the magical days of like 1974 before all of these restrictions. It's nothing of the kind. In some ways, that's a good thing, right? It means that people are going to expect a lot more than she's prepared to offer and may be motivated to join efforts to pressure her for better or more expansive legislation. Raised expectations can be a good thing. But really, what's more important than anything is what we actually do. I mean, that's the whole point of this panel, right? It's like it doesn't fundamentally matter if Harris wins or not. What matters is what we're organized to do and what we're organized to demand. Um, Martin Luther King put it well, of course. He said, this is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Right? That's you can right. say, OK, great, we, we get rid of Dobbs. That would be a step forward. But that in no way guarantees returning to any sort of unfettered access to abortion rights. Um, we can really only win that kind of legislation and really that kind of sea change by organizing, right? By by creating real pressure on whoever gets elected. Um, I think that the example of the women's movement in the beginning, in the 1970s, I should say, you know, where there were women out in the streets who had signs that said free abortion on demand, who told their stories, who talked about the impact that lack of access to abortion had had on themselves. 
that's what won the, the Roe decision in the first place. It was passed under Nixon, right, when Nixon was in office. It was a Nixon appointee to the Supreme Court who wrote the majority decision um, passing or handing down Roe in the first place. They did it then. I think we can do it even better if we're really clear that this is where power comes from and the demands have to come from below in a way that actually fundamentally changes our own expectations and what we think is possible. Thanks so much, Tristan. Um, our final speaker, before we open it up for a discussion, and I'll talk a little bit about how that'll work in just a moment, but um, our last speaker will be Michelle Edelman McCormick from Cooperation Vermont. So, uh, thanks everyone for your comments. We get to hear from some of you um, often, but this is really good, and I, uh, I appreciate having this conversation and actually having it with people uh, and not just on social media that has <laughs> seemed to have absolutely lost its mind in my humble opinion. And everybody's like so wicked freaked out about what they perceive as a crisis in democracy. And um, newsflash, folks, this is a foundational problem, mm -hmm. right? Like we're, this isn't, this wasn't a working democracy, an actual democracy that now is just like at some weird crisis point. Like this is, this is a result from its foundation of a system that was designed to be exclusionary, right? And, and we keep fighting for a seat at the table that should have just been flipped, okay? And when people, you know, talk about the, the, what they think are the nuances of the differences between the Democratic and the Republican Party in this country. And I'm just like, yo, the Democratic Party in the United States is like Republican light. It's got a little better branding. The packaging is fancier, you know, looks a little bit more appealing, but it's still going to kill you. OK, and and that's I mean, that that is where I'm at with it. And I think that, that the Palestine movement in particular, this moment in this particular moment in history has just really so blatantly exposed what an absolute death cult the US federal government really is, mm -hmm. right? And, and they, oh, hmm, there's just so, there's so much to say, <laughs> But it, you know, when we get, we get down to it, especially the way that this election season, if you will, has shifted and, and moved into this, you know, new era with uh, Kamala Harris, you know, being the uh, heir apparent. Um, I, I don't remember anybody getting to vote on that. Just as a pinpoint, a matter of democracy, that just <laughs> well, that just happened, didn't it? Right? Because um, a half a billion dollars will do that for you, apparently. Um, but, you know, just just, you know, going back to, to the, the Palestine in here in Vermont. Right. It just it just hit me personally as such like a well, now there it is. is it, there it is, folks. Right. The exact same week that we were able to somehow send another 20 billion dollars to Israel for arms to further this horrific genocide that's happening, FEMA runs out of money yeah. before we even get warmed up for hurricane season. And one of the largest fires in, in U.S. history is raging in California. FEMA just runs out of money and they just go home, right? And this is a Democratic White House still, in case you're, you're you know. Um, and, and so it's my point with the few minutes that I have is not so much about what to do with this election. It's really about what do we do after this election, right? Because what we do after this election is a little bit irrespective of what actually happens in this election, right? It's gonna play out a little bit differently. I mean, I personally, there's just me and maybe a few other people, that see, you know, if if there isn't a Trump win, uh, that we really are on the brink of of an, an armed, you know, civil insurrection. Um, I mean, when you think about throughout history, 
what an unpunished uh, failed coup attempt is, it's really just a dress rehearsal, <laughs> right? And we can look at points throughout you know, world history that that has played out. And so what, what does that mean for us? What does it mean if there's a Trump win, right? What does it mean if there's a Kamala win and then there isn't this armed, you know, insurrection? It's still the blank check that they already have to oppress actual progressive movement, actual left movement. It is going to just continue along this march even more unfettered to strengthen the power of the ruling class, right? So much wealth accumulation that has happened just in my lifetime. I mean, I am getting older, but I'm not that damn old, right? Just in my lifetime, the massive amount of wealth accumulation and the cycle of Republican and Democrat, and Republican and Democrat, and Republican and Democrat, you know, with the House and the Senate and the, you know, and it, and nothing has changed except for like this washing machine, like this sieve cycle of things just getting worse and worse and worse for the working class, right? More and more of this country, the land being held instead of being principally decommodified, right? Instead of having real meaningful conversations about land back, more and more of it's actually going into the hands of real estate hedge funds. And without access to land for homes, and without access to land for, for agriculture and food production, we are ever, ever, ever more dependent on our overlords. And so what I would posit, right, is what we, we do now, we really have to get serious and busy no matter what in building our own systems of solidarity economics because the more that we're dependent on that system, the more that they have control over us. Whatever it is that we can do within our communities and be connected to the communities around us who are doing similar things, in a solidarity economics framework to break free from that capitalist hold, right? But we have to get really serious, in my opinion, around community self-defense. Some of that does happen, but it's very loosely defined. It's very casual and it's not, um, it needs to really strengthen in our own geographic area. Because while we might not be in the middle of, you know, Mississippi when this all goes down and we're in Vermont, it's gonna feel like maybe we're a little bit cushioned and all, all of the things, that's not the look, right? We need to be prepared to provide solidarity and support to people who are going to need shelter. They're going to need safety. They're gonna need support. And I hope I'm making sense without being too blatant. Anyway, I'll pass. All right, thank you so much to the panel of speakers. Um, I believe, will we be uh, turning off the video for the discussion section or are we keeping it going? Was there a decision around that? Um, would, would does anyone have any issue with their we're, we're about to move into the discussion section does anyone have any issue or would prefer not to have their voice recorded um, or potentially be on camera during the discussion if you would rather that not happen please don't hesitate to voice that concern and it's for I'm sorry and it's for yeah for channel 17 yes Good to, good to note. Okay, well, if everyone's okay with that, then we'll go ahead and keep the recording going. Um, so as we move into the discussion, um, we have, uh, let's say roughly uh, 30 minutes uh, for a discussion. So um, the way that I'll do this is that if you would like to speak, uh, please raise your hand and I will be keeping a stack. I'll identify you by an article of clothing. Um, please raise your hand any time that you would like to speak, even if someone else is speaking, you know, just feel free to raise your hand and I'll, and I'll get you on the stack. Um, I'm gonna ask that folks keep their comments to two and a half minutes roughly, just so that there's time for um, enough 
have people to speak. Uh, when you're at two minutes, I'll like I'll, I'll give a little tap with my pen, uh, just so you know that you've got about 30 seconds left, and then I'll tap again, uh, and that'll mean kind of find the end of your thought. Um, and so, uh, but just also so you know, you can feel free to ask questions directly to the panelists. However, they are going to come back at the end uh, to answer any questions or kind of share some of their final thoughts. So, um, you know, feel free to ask questions and folks in the audience should also feel free to answer questions that come up and give thoughts of their own. Um, and so with that, I will uh, open up the discussion. The one with the stand in the middle, you guys use that one. And then I can hand that one to whoever wants to. Okay. In honor of the love of you. All right. Thank you very much for coming out. All right. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Thanks for a great panel, great discussion. Um, yeah, my question is. Have there, so we heard about uh, AOCs, um, I think really, um, um, yeah, you know, just lies. AOC lied on TV, I think, for her career. I'm wondering, are there examples throughout the history of like the last 150 years of um, politicians telling the truth or, you know, um, you know, just com coming up from the bottom and staying with the movement. Do we, ha do we have examples of that? Um, is that, you know, is that something that we should, and are there, you know, how do we, you know, are we finding the wrong people or are we, um, do we not have a program? Do we not have a party? Do we not have, um, schools to train people and how to do this. Um, does AOC have lo the wrong theory of change where, you know, when she felt disconnected from, I don't know, like optimism about the international working class as being able to change things and just thought, well, if, you know, if the working class is never going to do anything, I guess I should just get my piece and, um, you know, kind of like make some deals behind closed doors. So, yeah, what's what's the strategy in the electoral department? Anybody got any ideas? Uh, oh, I was, I was hoping to speak next time. Second thing, sorry, I didn't mean to direct no, the you know, you know, that. that that's the way that this will work. Is there will be some kind of like, shoot, right? Well, shoot, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't intending to answer your question. If I had to answer, I would say that the only people who got elected her into office that I could think of are uh, dead, Harvey Milk being an example, that they've been shot. Um, I think that that's, that's really, you know, I, I don't put any faith or hope in electoralism, if not just because at this point, that you know, the, the most anecdotal example I could give was that my father was like getting so radicalized after that debate. He was so finally upset about Biden, about Trump. He was finally like talking about how we needed proper resistance to Donald Trump. And then the moment Kamala Harris became the candidate, the second that she became the candidate, he said to me, it feels like everything's going to be all right. <laughs> The instant that the Democrat, that like to, to me, the danger with electoralism is that like if Trump, like I think of it like we're a car speeding towards a cliff. If Trump gets elected, he's going to step on the gas. If Kamala gets elected, she's going to tint the windows. Like where it's going to make it so that we just stop caring, we stop paying attention to all the problems that are in, in front of us. And that to me seems more dangerous. Sorry, I know that's not entirely a response to what you were saying. I'm gonna say this. Do you mind? Oh, oh, over there. First, I'm going to quickly share with everybody a little bit of my own history. I'm a first generation Bosnian diaspora. I had family who lived under four growing years of Nazi occupation. I had a, fa a relative who was a member of, of Tito's Partisans who was scooped up by the Nazis, sent to the Yasinovac death camp. And, and, and nearly 50 years later, Yugoslavia vi violently splintered apart. 
and I had family who lived through that and the subsequent genocide. There are parallels to what happened in former Yugoslavia, the years leading up to the Second World War, World War II, and also during the Yugoslav War. And we're seeing similar parallels happening again, both in Palestine, even political dynamics happening here in the U.S. as well. And following up from Michelle's remarks, and also conversations uh, I had with, had with my late mother. It, it, it's not too too far from reality that that we may see a violent splintering within our lifetime or sometime in the not so distant future in this country. A more likely scenario that we may see happening is likely something identical to the troubles in Ireland. That kind of violence, including the, the right wing violence that taken place the years leading up to, to World War II and also following World War II in Italy, Spain and some other countries across Europe as well. There's definitely, those are some things that we must consider in years that come because we are, we are living in, in incredibly dangerous times and it will only get more dangerous regardless of who, of who gets elected. This is reality. And to get together with building solidarity networks, we must also figure out how to work with communities that are otherwise unwilling to organize. I'm slowly working in a rural community in North Burlington, and there is a lot of people who frankly don't care, and, 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 and what I'm seeing within our movement, there's no plan, no strategy to, to inspire people to care. To radicalize people to, to, to take a stand for our shared humanity. From, from, from our shared humanity and, 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 all, and also building a movement in our rural communities. The rural communities will serve as a bulwark in the event of any counter revolutionary struggle. And that's something something that I'm also noticing, considering the, the, the dynamics of some of the communities involved. And, and also the presence of the military industrial complex and, big, and, and, and other related big businesses as well. No, I just uh, thanks thanks for that. Actually, um, you know, because one of the things that I, I'm always trying to to get people to really think about is uh, stop talking to each other all the time, right? Like seriously, like we have to be out in our communities having the hard conversations having uh, the direct connections with the broad spectrum of our community where that actual common humanity exists. Because for a, quite a while now, and, and what we're seeing is the, the, the peak moment of uh, identity politics, you know, resulting out of just a really long time of, of them having us out here fighting a fake culture war, right? When while an intersectional approach is absolutely, you know, critically important, we've kind of really lost sight of that class struggle, <laughs> right? Uh, and we have to get back to that. We have to be really willing to have, you know, open and honest conversations with folks, you know, who up until I have, I don't see any new flags, but a couple of weeks ago, you know, had the F Biden flags in their house and the truck, you know, those are my first cousins, y'all, right? Like, seriously. And um, they're equally affected by the struggles of the working class because they're part of the working class, right? And so when they're, when they're hearing portions of our population, when they're hearing, you know, the, the privilege that they have, right? and they know the living conditions that they're struggling in. They know that they're carrying the weight of half of their family who's you know, gone the route of being self-medicated for lack of proper mental health services in this country and are in and out of like the prison systems, you know, and all, all the things, right? And so like these folks who have very little are saying, where's, where's my privilege? And somebody, the right wing, right, is out there telling them what what who their enemy is yeah. right and we need to be having those really frank and open com you know honest conversations with people and be like yeah there is an enemy but it ain't this and it ain't that right 
and we need to really help guide and, and have those conversations with folks and, and just stop just talking to each other all the time. I wanted to come in on Theo's questions because I didn't want to leave anything in chat not to uh, anticipate what's going to happen in the election. But uh, too soon. We, we don't know. This thing is going to be a, a dead heat till November. And so we don't know which way it's going to go. Um, but I want to address what Theo raised because I think that it grows out of the last phase of the radicalization, which everybody was looking to politicians as the vehicle to free us and looking for saviors. I think that's a lot of what was invested in Bernie Sanders and a strategy of going into a capitalist party, running on its ballot line with the hope that that strategy would open up space for the left. And the last four years have proved the exact opposite. The left is weaker, more disorganized, more disoriented, and it produces a situation where you see Sanders and AOC not as the opponents of the Democrats, but loyal foot soldiers for the Democrats. Both Sanders and AOC. AOC AOC's speech was a disgrace. It's a disgrace that she called herself a socialist and said that Kamala Harris was fighting for a ceasefire. That's a lie and she knows it. But that's the price you pay for going into that party. So I think we need to suspend our hope for saviors from above and a strategy in and through the Democratic Party. And we also need to understand the impasse that you get in if you're elected. And I hope people who are elected talk about that because inside the government, you're actually inside the belly of the beast as part of a representative system that's not democratic, that has got guardrails everywhere and unelected guardrails that are tied to the capitalist system. That is the capitalist state at its very core exists to defend the existing order. So politicians, even good ones, are gonna be prisoners of the system if they get elected. So I think we need to flip the question entirely and look for us as our own emancipators, us as our own saviors, working class people, oppressed people, and I'll just end by saying this is why Palestine is such an important issue, not just for Palestinians, but for everybody in the world, because it is showing that people resist and fight for their own liberation. And you have to follow their lead, including in the United States. And that means breaking with these two parties, building our class struggle, building our unions and seeing ourselves as our own emancipators and as part of a global movement for the self-emancipation of the world's workers. Thanks. Yeah, I think I might be the only elected person in the room, um, <laughs> which is okay. telling. It's, safe. It's, it's a safe space. Oh no, I, I, I don't worry <laughs> about what I say. Um, thankfully, I have a good district at my back. Um, and uh, yeah, so I guess the way I think about it as somebody who has decades of organizing experience before I actually ran for office and I never intended to run for office, it just kind of happened. Um, and um, is that elections are just a really, um, they're a helpful like weather vane for how much organizing we've done. Um, and I, have my own opinions about like what's an effective strategy towards uh, like addressing our majoritarian political system in the country um, that I won't talk about on camera. Um, <laughs> but I, um, I, I do think that um, what I'm hearing, I like the way the conversation's going in here where we are just talking about the need to like knock every door, organize the working class, build our own power, mm -hmm. take the system back. Like, it, is it like I can't do a fucking thing if I don't have a community behind me mm -hmm. fighting for me and with me to get something done in a political quasi-representative 
body. So um, yeah, uh, we should just be organizing. Like, um, and primaries, primary elections, you know, like are way more interesting than the actual election. Uh, that's where we advance, in my opinion. But um, you know, like. I think where we're at electorally is just a reflection of um, how much organizing we're doing in our communities. Thank you. Precisely. All right, um, Will? Yes. All right, Will, and then what meet the place? Yes. Yeah. I really think in evaluating all of this, though, we must be considering at all times a more revolutionary third worldist and Leninist perspective of that the most oppressed peoples of the planet are not in America. That, like, we must be careful to eternally acknowledge that, like, my thoughts aren't the most fully formed on the matter, but that for the majority of Americans, they are not going to face the full discomfort that is necessary to prop up the lifestyles of the people living here. Your average working class American is is still going to be a recipient and beneficiary of imperial super profits. They are still going to be coaxed into receiving their, you know, cheap uh, avocado, like cheap fruits from around the world, their cheap resources, their cheap labor from oppressed peoples around the planet. And so long as the owning class, the ruling class, the bourgeoisie, if we might just go as far as to say that, so long as they are able to ensure that those super profits keep coming our way, then there's a lot of people who will be bought out by that. There's a lot of people where it won't matter. You know, obviously, we are going to only see the contradictions become more apparent in this country as we approach, let's call it the end. <laughs> but like, it won't matter to a lot of people because they'll be able to put it off into somebody else. I think the perfect example is the electric car. It won't matter to most people that we're all dying of climate change because they'll be able to be driving a car that is nice and clean despite all the people in Bolivia dying to mine the lithium inside those batteries. Like we need to acknowledge and that is why I think Palestine is the most crucial moment of the the most crucial movement of the moment. It is understanding that the most oppressed peoples in the world are who we must fight for first, if not just because everything else is built upon their backs. Everything else is built upon their oppression, and we are not going to be able to end our oppression until we begin with the greatest oppressions occurring worldwide. Thank you. All right, I've got uh, Wapik up here, uh, followed by Helen. Yes. Um, I was uh, early, early morning in Burlington uh, around 7.30 in the morning and at least I passed three people sleeping on the sidewalk. Yeah, exactly. No American going to care about Palestine if they don't care about the people on the streets here. Mm -hmm. Drug addiction problems here where we are sitting around us. I grew up in a refugee camp. I never seen something like that. You have to take things on perspective. On the first question asked, you have to go back to the history of this country. This is a racist country, oppressive. And they graduated after what they call a great war, World War II, with a great generation everybody in school proud of, etc., to be imperialist, oppressive to the rest of us outside of here. For us to look at the United States as a constitution and bill of rights is perfect. It's so beautiful. But this country are the biggest liars in history when it comes to translate what's on their hands. They are racist. Racist. So to do that, you have to correct what at home to really stand with Palestine. For the socialist who became Democrat, I felt he was the worst of them all. Bernie Sanders, on his uh, campaign to be president, 
Colonel West and James Abuzorbi were chairs on his campaign. Yeah. He kicked them out and refused to bring the Palestinian question to the floor. So we cannot lie at each other's. Like if we have this guy will be better than this, better than that. Bunch of lies. They live it and they call it politics. <laughs> I appreciate Kate, our representative, uh, that she's sitting with us. She stood with us when we introduced ceasefire, when many, many didn't sign it. She sponsored it, and I hope she will work with us when we sponsor apartheid free community and we sponsor uh, uh, Nakba uh, recognition on this day. Thank you. All right, I've got Helen next, and then um, time for one, maybe two more speakers before we throw it back uh, to the panel. Yeah, I think the, the, the best elected officials are the ones who have movements behind them and who are accountable to those movements. And they're accountable to those movements more than they are accountable to the establishment because the establishment puts all of the pressures on the elected officials to do it the way it's always been done and think about the conservatives. What will they think? And you can't do that. It's too radical. And so having the pressure of a, of a popular movement is the key accountability. Though I still think Theo's questions about, do we know any establishment politicians who don't lie is, is probably the, the, the biggest question I've ever heard asked in a meeting because you flummoxed us. Um, uh, uh, you know, if, they, if they haven't been killed or they haven't been a kicked out, like a Jeremy Corbyn. Or, um, but the other thing I wanted to say is that the, the, perhaps the, the biggest ideological glue that keeps the Democrats and Republicans together is nationalism. And they tell us that it's all about what's good for the country and that we're all in it together. And that's why I, you know, I disagree with Will about um, the, the oppressed and workers in the US getting the benefits from the wealth of the country because as Michelle said, the opposite is actually the case. We don't have money for flood relief in Vermont because so much money is going to Israel's bombs. You know, I mean, that's, I think our movement has to combat that idea that our interests are bound up with the people who rule us in our countries and recognize that our interests are bound up with other working people and oppressed people across the world. And that's what Palestine is teaching, you know, whole generations of people right now. I look at my phone and I get images of rallies from London, from my friends and family, um, and from Quebec, from friends, and from India, you know, I mean, it's like, this is a global movement and people are recognizing that we have more in common with each other than we do with the people who are elected. So, and again, wh whether it's Trump or Harris, that's going to continue to be the number one question. Um, it just amazes me how the parallels between the American politics and the Israeli politics are. When I, I remember, like, there is the Likud in Israel and there is a Labour Party. When the Likud is, is elected, the ugly face of Israel is there. And everybody talks about it everywhere in, around the world that these are not the right people. But if you elect the labor people, then you polish the image of Israel. Now, of course, the same thing is happening here. We think that if you elect the Democrats, it's the polished image of the country, while the uh, Republicans and Trump is the ugly face of things. To me, they are both the same, and both like the Democrats are like the world and she's dead. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of since the Palestinian issue got started, 
I think a lot of our people talk about the one vote issue, you know, the one issue vote. And meaning that, you know, you cannot just vote for, you know, when the U.S. taking Pakistan as a primary focus of why I'm voting this way or that way. But of course, I don't know if people understand that um, the, the, Israel, the American support to Israel is not just about Pakistan. I mean, America, we should protest that because, like you said, you know, we send it twenty million dollars to Israel, and we don't have emergency funds to support the state. You know? yeah. We don't have healthcare. We don't have education. Yeah. That is what it is happening. Yeah. That's real job. That's right. And the impact is funded by American dollars through the Israeli budget, through the American money coming back to the Israel. So it's not the one issue or it's the societal vote. Exactly. And the question that's still on my mind is like. You know, we, we, what Will said that the Palestine issue now brings sort of crystal clear picture of, of where the American politics stands when it comes to international, uh, the international arenas. It surprises me how Israel is focused it is. You know, like, it, 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 whether it's in the Middle East or anywhere, it's the American politics internationally, Israel is focused. I know Israel has so much hold in America, I did not know, but I now know much better. <laughs> uh, but my my question is is like for organizers is what what can we do to reach to a certain mass where we can make a difference? Yeah. We don't want to be talking to each other all the time because we are on the same wavelength, mm -hmm. but we need to go beyond yep. community building and and talking to our community and you know, finding venues where individual can take action, not just you know, not just organizations take action, but an individual who's unhappy with seeing the images on TV, to to be able to do something about it. Yeah. yeah. And we need to do that. And I, I, I think that's the question to improve it. How do we move into empowering individuals who are concerned to take action? discussion. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to throw it back to the panelists. We'll go in reverse order um, to give kind of closing remarks. Um, I'll give you all three minutes each um, if you would like. And then I've just got a couple of quick announcements at the end, and then we'll wrap up for the evening. All right, so uh, feel free to go ahead, Michelle. Um, closing arguments. Um, yeah. So, Way better than Biden. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what day is it? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question, to be honest. Um, just really emphasizing, you know, the need to be in our communities and having the hard conversations with a broad range of folks mm -hmm. and um, not just, you know, the, the echo, echo chamber and, and really focusing on the common humanity in in all of us, right? And that 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 right there is what brings me to, fine, we'll make it a single issue vote. That's why neither one of them are getting it, right? <laughs> I'm okay with it being a single issue vote. You cannot convince me that my bodily autonomy is somehow more important or more valuable than the Palestinian mother who had to bury limbs. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me. And if I know that they see her and her children as expendable, they do me too. Yeah. There's no That's differentiation. Right. So I'll, I'm okay with making it a single issue vote. Neither one of them are getting it and I don't care. They want to. They want the vote. Be better. Do better. Represent the working class. Do something not just you know for the petty bourgeois, right? Do 
something impacting for the working life. They're not capable because that's not how they're set up. It's not how they're designed. They are set up to represent the interests of the ruling class. The rest of us, once we have exceeded or, or surpassed our, our utility to them are absolutely expendable. Enter into you know the prison industrial complex exhibit A, mm -hmm. right? We'll squeeze that last bit of labor out of you, warehouse you until you die. Yep. So that, that, they're not getting my vote, I don't care. Um, yeah, I guess I just I wanted to weigh in on two of the things that came up in the discussion. I thought Theo's question was was great. And um, I was thinking of it in similar terms as Kate, but a little differently, which is like politicians are at their best when the movements are strongest. Right. So it's kind of wild. Like if you go back and read what any Democrats or Republicans in the early 70s were saying about crime, about racism, about women's rights, about gay rights. Right so much better than Democrats now or even people on the left flank of the Democratic Party because there were movements that had changed the entire nature of the national discussion and had raised expectations um, beyond people's imaginations today. Similarly with the 1930s, right? FDR was not like a friend of the working class, but we, there was progressive legislation that he helped pass because people were forming unions, because there was the growth of revolutionary organizations. Working class combativity was at its highest point in the history of the country. So it's, you know, AOC went through lots of good trainings, right? Like she was an activist. She came from some fairly good bona fides, but she, I'm kind of, I'm still a little stunned by how bad it is because she, she pretty quickly became untethered from the movements that she had come from. So it, it still comes back to what we do day to day on the ground on a grassroots level. Um, the other thing I was thinking of was also just about sort of um, our relationship with people in the developing world, because I think about patients of mine, for example, who um, need insulin, who have diabetes, right? And I have several who've been unable to afford their, their insulin, a life-saving medication. Um, and a lot of that insulin is produced in developing countries, right? And people are paid terribly to produce it under really shitty conditions. But the the people in this country who can't afford that insulin it's not because they're ben like they, they're not benefiting right it's actually the people who run pharmaceutical industries and insurance companies who are benefiting so i think looking for our common enemies and figuring out how to build real solidarity to improve the conditions of people here and around the world is super important because yeah i mean you go down the line whether it's housing education uh drug treatment um you know health care obviously like they are starving this this the system here in a way that dramatically impacts people's lives in order to maintain the wealth and profits of the people at the top of this system to the even further immiseration of people who are producing those products that we sometimes have access to but often don't. Um, so solidarity internationally is really key. If you want, again, to help the Palestinians or the people all over the world, in Africa, the people who needs help, etc. Just get the hell out of there. We are better without you. If you're going to keep coming over there and building military bases or supporting the biggest military bases like Israel, because it's in the eye of the American and the West, it's not helping the Jews. It's just a military base. And we can prove it through history. The West did what they did in the Holocaust. And for them, it's let's use the Jews somewhere here there. But we have resources that we can live off over there. And we have people in Gaza alone. There is a 12 university. Don't underestimate Gaza. Mm -hmm. We have the lowest illiteracy in the world. We don't need your help. We don't need you there. Because when you show up, you are an occupier, colonizer. You are not a friend. So it's not out of a good well. They are in Africa. They are not in a good well 
anywhere in the world. They never came here out of a good well. <laughs> Look at the history of the American. See the indigenous and the black and the brown, what happened to them. Reflect on them. And this is what your country do to us. They are not far off from 200 years ago. They still living it, but the system is perfect. The system is so perfect that a president with dementia for a year and a half, he didn't know when he's supposed to leave until the money on his bucket came down. Yeah. Nobody was contributing to his campaign. Another Republican president, he led this country for three years and he has Alzheimer. <laughs> Reagan. It's a strange country we are living in. It's a strange country. The only thing, the American people, hardworking people, are tired. They wake up, they want to pay the rent, they want to pay the mortgage, they want to pay the car, they want to pay. They are rat race. So they don't want to think of what's happening to them. Don't make it late. Get involved. Remember, you can learn from the Palestinians. Yeah. We get rid of hunger ourselves. We feed ourselves when we want to feed ourselves. We have the best education the world ever seen. We have the best doctors the world ever seen. You know, I am one out of eight children. We all, all college graduate many times, you know? So be careful, just learn from those poor people. Thanks all, uh, great, great discussion. The influence on AOC, and I'll start on this and move off it quickly, but on AOC, Sanders was the model. AOC came out of the Sanders campaign. And the view is there, you get, this is since 1990 in Sanders, you get elected to office and you make change from on top. No organic connection to movements. So this is not surprising yeah. given the political orientation. I think that the question for me is not superhuman politicians, but it's accountability. So I agree with what people have said about movements. Movements influence politicians. And middle Black Lives Matter, whole Democratic Party, yeah, I support Black Lives. I'm critical of the police. The movement um, beside, what do you call it? Um, subsides. <laughs> and then, you know, pro-police, these yeah. same politicians. So. But for me, the question of accountability is, is not when there's a mass movement. It's at the ebbs of the movement. Are those politicians representatives going to be still accountable in some structural way to the movement? Because that's what carries us through. The content, not having continuity between the ups and downs of struggle has harmed the left in the United States for 100 years. Um, the second thing is... Um, Sanders, the most popular politician in the United States. The problem is the strategy is not good. Yeah. That Sanders never exercised any power. He, had, he reflected what people were feeling and experiencing, right? But it was a strategic failure. So I think the question is, where do we have the power? And can we link on the hopes and aspirations organizing to those places where we have power? And one of the places we have power is through workplaces and striking and disruption. Historically, that's been key. So in terms of, you know, it's easy to be pessimistic about the future. There's no question about that. But I think our responsibility is to be optimistic and look for where the possibilities are to exercise power. Because it's not the ballot box. It's not in the legislature. It's not in Congress. For any of the changes that we need, there has to be mass, mobile, mass popular mobilization, importantly, class organization. And you know, think of what you know, the UAW su successful strike, uh, the United Auto Workers successful strike. So that was catalyzed by a move to democratize the union, so you know, some accountability to what workers are experiencing, and then pushed to a strategy 
that was able to win some things, you know, as opposed to the bureaucratized conservative union leadership that preceded it. You know, workplaces are heterogeneous. They bring people together from all different ethnicities. And, you know, so it's a way to bridge um, working class divergence and forge unity. And then think of the railroad worker strike. That was another possibility of a national strike that, again, would have galvanized kind of hopes because it's a way to exercise power. You know, we're striking UAW one, railroad workers can win. So I think that's where we need to kind of root our political energies. Um, and Democrats squashed the possibility of that strike. So as Malcolm X said, you put the Democrats first, they put you last. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just again, I want to say a big thank you to the panelists. That was excellent. Thank you to everyone coming out tonight. This has been a really great discussion and hopefully uh, the first of more to come. Um, just a few things for real quick announcements. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm a member of uh, the Tempest Collective. It is a Marxist revolutionary organization trying to build the left wing on a whole range of issues on a national level. Um, we put on lots of events like this. If you're interested in hearing about more events that we'll be putting on in the future, um, please uh, sign up on our email list that is over in the corner there. And, and also get on that email list if you're interested in potentially becoming a member. Um, talk to myself or Paul or Ashley, Helen, uh, all, all members here. So um, you know, definitely looking to grow that. So come talk to us if you're interested. Um, a couple of uh, important announcements about things coming up. Um, on October 19th, um, the Vermont Coalition for Palestinian Liberation is going to be putting on a conference on Palestine. This is an all-day educational event for people to learn about uh, the struggle for Palestinian liberation on a, from a whole range of fronts. It's actually going to be happening from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m., so there's going to be lots of great talks, chances for discussion. Um, it's a really, really great way to both learn more about the struggle and also get plugged into the struggle that is ongoing here locally. Where? Thank you. Um, at the uh, old, old North Penn uh, Community Center. Um, so yeah, again, 10 a.m., 7 p.m., Old North End Community Center, October 19th. Um, and then finally, uh, on September 8th, uh, the Palestine Coalition will be having a contingent at the Pride Parade, uh, and that's going to be meeting at 11.30 um, downtown Burlington. So it will be a fantastic event. It's fantastic that 